responded to the client and sent them the pricing, if they are interested in booking, we set up a call. I do this for a couple of reasons. First, I want to make a personal connection. Now, in the past, I have done this with a FaceTime call. Right now, I want it to be as convenient for my client as it can be. Sometimes this means that they're taking the call during their lunch hour. Sometimes this means that they're just not ready to be on FaceTime. I don't really think that FaceTime makes it any more personable than a phone call. So for me, I'm, I'm, now it's a phone call. But in the past, I did make this a FaceTime call. When we first get on the phone, I'll say, is this still a good time to chat? And I do, I ask them when a convenient time is. Sometimes these calls are in the evening, sometimes it's in the morning, sometimes it's at their lunch break, whenever. I'll say, is this still a good time to chat? I'll say, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I cannot wait to tell you all about everything I can create for you. First, is it okay if I just ask a few questions to get a better idea of what it is I can create for you? And I'll ask them, what is prompting you to do this now? Do you have a vision for your shoot? Do you want to bring anyone with you, your spouse or partner or your children? I want to know more about them. I can't market or sell to someone if I don't know what they value. That is really sales 101. You need to know your client. If you know that your client's most important thing in their world is their children, then you need to encourage them to bring their children in because your sales will go up if you have pictures of your, your client with her children. If it's her dog, maybe you consider having her bring her dog to the shoot. Whatever she values, you need to speak to it. You need to support it and you need to have her talk about what she values. I want to get to know her. I take a lot of notes during this call. I'm writing down the things that a girlfriend would know. I want to know the name of, of her spouse or boyfriend. I want to know any names that she drops during that conversation. I ask where she's from. This is kind of a get to know you sort of call as well. By the end of this call, and keep in mind, I'm smiling. I am smiling during this call. She can't see me, but it changes the tone of your voice. By the time she's done telling me about her, I say, okay, thank you so much for giving me all that information. I think I have a sense of what I can create for you. I'm gonna start telling you all about my photo shoots. It's gonna be a lot of information. Don't worry about writing this down or remembering all of it. If you decide to book, a really beautiful welcome packet is gonna to come to you in the mail, but I just wanna give you a sense of everything I can do for you. And then I start to explain everything from the minute she books and the welcome packet she's gonna get in the mail to how she's gonna come with her hair clean and dry and her face clean and moisturized the morning of the shoot to how she's gonna just mirror my posing during the shoot to the reveal. And then we get to the pricing. This is important. Yes, she has seen my session fee on my website, she should have read through the PDF that I attached for her before she, we ever got on the phone, but I don't know that she's read it. She could have not read it. This is when I need to start talking about it. As a business owner, as a salesperson, not a camera owner, a business owner, you need to talk about money. You need to be able to have that conversation. Practice with someone if you want. If this is awkward for you, because it was awkward for me when I started, then sit down with a parent or a spouse or a child, whatever, somebody, someone, and just start having this conversation. And I'll say, you know, my packages start at $14.90, my albums start at $36.90. Some clients spend $5,000, some spend $15,000. Whatever you decide to spend is up to you. Note that I don't say to people, some clients spend $14.90 and some clients spend $36.90. Now, granted, that is partially because that doesn't usually happen. That's, that, that, that's not my normal sale. But it's also partially sales psychology. Those are not the numbers that I want in their heads. I want you to know that the average, well, it's no longer the average, but there was a time when my average was 5,000 and then some clients were spending 15,000. I want those, those mile markers in your head. So first off, if I say 15,000, suddenly 5,000 doesn't sound nearly as scary. It's just, it's just comparison. And then if I say 5,000, suddenly you're looking at, at the things in my, you know, my pricing menu that were 3,000 and suddenly that's not seeming as big as maybe it did when you first looked through it and thought, oh God, who's spending $3,000 on pictures? And it's like, you're about to, you're about to, because I'm about to take really good pictures of you. Um, so whatever, whatever works for you, but it is sales psychology. Your clients are, are interested, your potential clients, they're interested in what you have to offer. They, they are, they're there, they're talking to you because they're interested, but they're on the hook. You have to kind of bait them in. But at the the same time, I, I want to scare off the people who aren't serious about it. I don't want someone coming in who's really only interested in the lowest package. I'm too busy. I am just too busy at this point in my career. Does that still happen? Yes, it does. I do still sometimes get people. I mean, I can't stop someone from coming in and spending the lowest possible amount, but I am on the phone going to use the bigger numbers because that does scare some people off. You will occasionally get people on the phone saying, well, can't you do it for a thousand dollars? 
It's like, no, no, I cannot do it for a thousand dollars. No, I cannot. And that's okay. What you do has value and you need to hold that space and hold your value and stand up for your work because it is a lot of work and your equipment is, is, is expensive. And what you do and your time and your time retouching and the, the time that you are investing, even just watching this tutorial, the hours you are spending watching this tutorial have value. And you are going to recoup that in what you charge and what you do for your clients. So talk through the pricing. So this is, so they've seen a little bit of the pricing on the website. They get the pricing menu through that PDF. This is now the third point of contact for pricing. The fourth point of contact is going to come when they get the welcome packet in the mail, because I'm going to send the pricing menu again. I want them to be so over the sticker shock by the time that they come in for their reveal that it's no longer a thing. I want, when I say, oh, that'll be $9,000. I want them to be like, okay. Or, oh, that's a lot of money. Yeah, it is. Will that be, you know, cash or credit card? How, how do you want to do it? It's no longer a thing because we've had the awkward conversations already. If you wait and have that awkward conversation at the point of sale, it's not going to go well. I know because I did it for the whole first year of my portrait business and it never went real well. Never did. You have to have the awkward conversation at some point, but also keep in mind, it's only awkward if you're awkward. It's only money. It's only money. We're not selling penicillin here. This is not medicine. This is not necessary. If someone really can't afford it, they won't come to you. This is not necessary to live. I think it's necessary for just about every other reason, but if someone really can't afford you, they won't come to you. If someone can afford you, they'll, they will make time and make space for what they value. So talk, talk to it somewhat lightly when people go, oh my God, I'm like, I know, right? Right? I'm expensive. You just, it's lighthearted. It's fine. People will make space for what they value. Um, so that is pretty much the call. Then at the end of it, I'm saying, okay, so if you're interested in booking, let me know and I will get with my stylist and we will get some date options for you. I cannot just give them a list of dates right off the bat. Um, partially it's, it's dependent on my stylist because my stylists don't work directly for me. They contract for me and partially depending on the personality of the client. And I don't know them until I have talked to them during that call. I don't know which stylist I want to bring in. Now, sometimes I don't have a choice. If one stylist isn't available, I might need to go to the other stylist, but I try really hard to pair my client with the stylist that I think will have the best personality match for them. Remember, this is experience driven. This is service driven. And my stylist is a huge, huge part of the photo shoot. Not just the way they do the hair and makeup, not just the skill set, but their personality. They are in each other's faces for two hours when they're in hair and makeup. And then she's still down here with her during the photo shoot. So I want the right person for that job. So after that, after that call, I will send her some date options. Once she's ready to book, I send her an invoice and I say in the invoice, your date is not secure until this invoice is paid. We will hold the date for 24 hours. After that, we will need to recheck availability. Let them know this. They, they cannot sit on the date for a week. I have other people who want that space. Um, if I don't hear from them, I will send one follow-up. After that, the date is gone and they will have to recheck availability. That, ne that never happens, but let them know this because it happened you know, once upon a time and, and you, don't, you want to put parameters in place so that you are not having to follow up and follow up and follow up. The more that you are able to just put those time-saving measures in, just the easier your life is because the more clients you have and, and the less you have to, to babysit, just the better. So at this point, she has paid her session fee and I'm gonna send her the portrait questionnaire. I'm gonna get her welcome packet in the mail. She's gonna start a mood board for me and we are gonna start planning an absolutely gorgeous session. A huge part of my luxury experience is my welcome packet. This is what I send to my clients when they first book their sessions to help them plan for the experience. It's actually an experience in and of itself. One client described this as an invitation to a party she didn't know she was excited to attend. I actually seal these with wax so that it's just a fun thing to open. My clients are excited about these. They Instagram them, they share them with their friends. I want to walk you through everything that I include here to just let you know how I prepare my clients for their session. So when they open it up, the first thing that they see is my face. I want them to see me smiling. I want them to see me happy. I am there to make this a wonderful experience for them. And I want them to know I'm not some cold fashion photographer. I am warm and I'm welcoming and I'm excited that they're here for their session. When they open the welcome packet, there's my session policies on rescheduling, on arriving on time, copyright information, information on the digital files, information on their makeover, on the photo shoot, the reveal and ordering session. Any potential question that they have is answered somewhere in this welcome packet. Are you still gonna get questions? Absolutely. But is the information there for them? Yes, it is. 
Then inside the packet are all kinds of goodies. Now I actually customize this depending on who I am shooting. So if I am shooting couples, if I'm shooting maternity, if I'm shooting a woman on her own, I actually have three different types of style guides that I send out depending on what kind of session I'm doing. Just to give you an example, let me open my maternity guide. So I created this to help expectant mamas know exactly, exactly what to expect and exactly what to bring. I wanted to cover safety in their packet because safety is of the utmost importance in maternity sessions. This is something that you as a photographer absolutely need to know. Um, things like their blood pressure, things like hydrating them, things like keeping their eyes open. You do not close a pregnant woman's eyes during her session. If you want her to look like her eyes are closed, you have her look straight down. You never close her eyes because her likelihood of getting dizzy is like 10 times that of a normal woman's. She could fall over, injure herself, critically injure the baby. I talk about going to the bathroom, how we understand that she may need to go constantly. I just want her to know that I am already anticipating her needs. This is gonna put her that much more at ease as we go into her session. But then I also want her to know that I'm anticipating her wardrobe needs. So for maternity, you can do so much more artistic work than you might do in a normal portrait session. I do a lot of draping with fabrics, with materials. You can use just a bandeau top and a fabric for a skirt. So I give some examples in terms of ways that we could create wardrobe, but then I give her a checklist, things to bring, and it's so simple. She can just literally go down the list, check it off, throw things in a bag the night before the shoot, and she's packed. It's that simple. I want to take all of the guesswork out of this planning session. And then there's the beauty guide. And this gives my clients ideas of when to get their hair and nails done, when to tan, which is never, you never spray tan before a photo session. These are things your clients don't know, helping them to get prepared. This is something that I created in this past year that my clients are raving about to me. I call it the Lux Guide. This gives them a step-by-step -step breakdown of everything to expect from the minute that they step out of their car to the second that they arrive for their ordering appointment. I have information about the reveal in the photo shoot. I have tips from former clients. I have information about the pricing breakdown, everything that they need to know. The more prepared and educated your clients are, the less stressed they are, the more they can enjoy the experience. You enjoy the things that you do when you know what to expect. We, we are nervous on the first day of school because we just don't know what to expect. By the you know 90th day of school, it's easy because you know, nothing's changed. Really nothing has changed, you just know. The, the anticipation isn't there. And then there's my product menu where I'm just again breaking down and giving them another way to see all of my pricing. I want them to put it in an easily accessible place so that they can reach for it the night before the photo shoot to pack and then grab it the next morning for directions on their way to my studio. So I put this in the mail the minute that they book their session to help them start planning. And I really get fantastic, fantastic feedback about it. Remember, they've just put down a pretty significant session fee and right now they've gotten nothing for it. Their shoot isn't for another three or four months. There's nothing physical for them to have, but this lets them know that I'm planning for them, I'm excited for them, I'm prepared for them. This is not something most photographers do. This already sets me apart. This starts the service. It's a really special touch. I mean, it's something that you might wanna to add to your studio. Hey guys, welcome to my studio, come on in. So when my clients arrive, I welcome them, I go out to their car, I help them with their wardrobe, service from the minute that they arrive. I want them to feel pampered. I want them to feel relaxed. I don't want them to worry about a thing. So when they first arrive, they come on in. This is Dolce, she's part of the experience. Um, this is actually where we do the reveal. It really doesn't have much to do with the shoot day itself, but during the reveal, this is where we'll sit. This is where we're gonna go through their pictures. So really the whole house is used for the shoot experience. But for the shoot day itself, after we go downstairs and put their dresses in the studio, I'm gonna bring them back and they're going to experience hair and makeup right here. We use this space because of the natural light. My studio is beautiful, it's functional, I love it, but it does not have natural light. This gives the hair and makeup artist just the, the most wonderful use of light and, and a beautiful space for them to just pamper the client. So this is where I give them the champagne where they can just relax and listen to music. Every time I pop a bottle of champagne, I, for myself, I, I uh, keep the cork, I write date and their name on it, and I, I keep it downstairs in, in a glass jar, just something that I do, something a little special. But So come on down with me, we're gonna add this to the jar, and I'm gonna show you the studio.
Now, something to think about, depending on the type of work that you shoot, is creating a private space. So I predominantly shoot women and usually they're coming by themselves, but if your clients are not coming by themselves or if there's a chance that maybe you're gonna shoot some intimate work, you might want a waiting area. So I do have the space upstairs. I also have space down here. So if a mom is coming with her child, but maybe she also wants some boudoir style pictures, I can throw something up on the TV, her child can sit and relax. I have multiple spaces that I can use to keep other people entertained. And in the meantime, we're just gonna add another cork to the jar. So let's also talk about gift bags. Let's talk about spoiling your clients. So on the day of the reveal, my clients aren't actually leaving my studio with anything. There's nothing for them to leave with yet. I haven't edited their pictures, I haven't printed anything, but they've just spent a lot of money. So what's the fun part? They need to leave with something. So I give them little gift bags. I'm giving them, I'm giving them mugs with my logo on it. I'm giving them, I'm giving them chocolate, sometimes wine. I'm giving them something fun to take home and celebrate the shoot with. Remember service, this is all about service. So come on in, let's go into the studio. So when your clients first step into your space, there needs to be a wow factor. This is my wow factor. I love this thing. <laughs> um, I wanted clients to walk in and not feel like they were in a basement because they are in a basement. I wanted them to feel like they were in a, in a spa-like, European-influenced, New York-vibed studio. And, and I do feel like we've kind of gotten that down. So I have, I have multiple shooting corners. I have a huge wardrobe over here full of gorgeous gowns for my clients to choose from. I have canvases nailed to the wall. I have gallery walls that we can shoot against. I have so much creative potential in one space. And I have clients who come in here and are just wowed. They are wowed that all of this could exist in a, resi in a residential home. So don't think that if you don't have a massive studio that you don't have the ability to create something luxurious, you do. You absolutely do. You can just get creative with it. This was actually an unfinished space when we purchased this home. And I shot in this space with it unfinished for longer than I would like to admit. Um, and clients were paying a lot of money to be here. And it just got to a place where I was able to finish it and it was time. It was, it was just time. Um, and I'm so thrilled with how it, with how it came to be. So when you are decorating your studio, it should reflect your style. It should reflect your taste. It should also be a little oasis for your clients. It should be calming. It should be, it should be pampering. It should be opulent. So if you look around, um, I put my little touches everywhere. Bees are my logo. So there are bees on the handles of the drawer. There are bees holding back my curtains. There are bees on my, uh, the dishes holding my bobby pins. There, there are just little touches of me everywhere. And I've just tried to make this a beautiful place for my clients to be. And then I want to show you my client wardrobe. These are all of the gowns that I have for my clients to choose from during their shoot. This actually came about over the years. So when you're starting out, this may not be something that you invest in immediately. It takes time. It takes time to build this up. And I eventually put all of this online so that my clients could see before they even booked what I had available to them. And that came about when I had a client several years ago who messaged me and just said, it would be so helpful to me if I knew what my options were before I got there. And I thought, you're right. You're absolutely right. You should see what they are before you get here. So I did that and my clients love it. They love it and it doesn't take that long to do. I highly recommend it no matter how many pieces you have in your studio. But this, this goes back about 15 feet and it is just packed full of dresses in various sizes, various colors, various cuts. I have such a variety. I wanted to show you one of my favorite pieces, which is this gold, this gold satin gown. My clients pull this out more than any other gown I don't know if it's the color because it's such a unique and unusual color or if it's the cut, it's so flattering. It's been photographed so many times. It's requested so frequently. I just love this piece. And, and you will just find that the more you photograph something, the more it will be requested because your clients see it. And, you know, you shoot what you love and then, and then it keeps being requested. So having a wardrobe is definitely something that is a draw for your clients because it's one less thing for them to worry about. They don't know how to dress for their shoots and they don't frequently own those types of pieces. So just one more, one more beautiful piece of service that you're offering your clients. 
So now that I've walked you through the studio and we've looked at the shooting corners that I use and we've looked at the wardrobe that I have available to my clients, now I wanna talk you through the technical components of owning a Lux studio. So let's start with cameras, the thing that makes you a photographer. So right now I am shooting with the Canon 5D Mark IV, which is this beautiful thing right here. So I have been shooting with this for about a year. Up until that point, I was shooting with the Mark III. I actually didn't mean to upgrade when I did. The Mark III is a beautiful camera. I didn't have a backup camera. I know if you're a wedding photographer, this is a must. This is something in the industry that you have to have. As a portrait photographer, it was a huge investment and something that I hadn't, I hadn't bought into yet but I was in the middle of an editorial shoot and my camera failed. It just stopped working. In the middle of the shoot that I had been preparing for for five months with a full team standing by and a model looking beautiful and ready to go, and I had to have someone run out and everyone had to pause for two hours while someone went out and purchased a camera for me and ran back and I just never wanted that to happen again. So now I have my, I still have my Mark III. I keep it as a backup camera, but I predominantly shoot on my Mark IV. So when we're talking about lenses, let's talk about investment. So there's a little bit of a difference in the lenses that you're seeing in front of you. These ones with the red line on them are the L series from Canon, and these ones on the right are slightly less expensive versions. Frequently, the difference between them is how low the f-stop will go and how fast the lens itself is. So these lenses I've invested more heavily in because these are the ones that I rely on the most. These, this is my 35 and my 50. My 50 goes down to 1.2. Do I use that in the studio? Most often not, not with portrait clients. And in the studio to do that with strobes, I would have to pull out an ND filter. Have I done it before? Absolutely. Do I do it often? No. But for my 100 and for my 85, which I don't use as frequently, I didn't see the point in investing as heavily. But the point isn't in getting the most expensive equipment. The point is in getting started. The point is in creating a beautiful portfolio. And if I asked you to go through my portfolio and pick out which pictures had been shot on the expensive lenses and which had been shot on the least expensive lenses, you would not be able to. So you can rent lenses if you need to, you can buy the less expensive versions, whatever you need to get started, let's just get started. So one reason that I predominantly only use prime lenses is that I'm so big on moving. You will see this when I'm shooting people, I just circle them. I jokingly say I'm like a shark and I am just circling you in the water. I'm always moving. I think a mistake so many photographers make when they have the ability to zoom is they don't move. They sit in one place and just assume that if they can zoom, they, they can stay stationary. You can't, you need multiple angles. Your client can't move, they're in one spot. But if you just move, if you move one foot to your right, you might get a completely different shot than if you were you know, a foot to your left. So if you get up and move, I, I just think you, you don't need the lens to do the work for you. So this is not a camera, but of course, to retouch our work, to process our work, we need some kind of a computer. I simply use a MacBook and then I attach it to a monitor. And that's how you'll see me retouch my work later this week. And then to retouch my work, I use a Wacom tablet. And you'd be surprised how long I retouched with a mouse before I switched over to a Wacom tablet. It doesn't have to be complicated. You can create absolutely beautiful work. You can create a luxurious experience on a relatively reasonable budget, and I am going to show you how to do that. I'm gonna show you a process that is so simple, and I'm gonna take you every step of the way. So now that we've talked about your camera and the lenses that you're using, let's talk about how you shape the light that you're going to use to light your client. So this is a strobe head. This is how you actually create the light. I use something called the Einstein, created by Paul C. Buff. This is not a very expensive lighting modifier. A lot of times when you're starting out lighting, you might start with a constant light. I started actually with a constant light, but then I went to, to the, uh, the Paul C. Buff Alien Bees, which is probably the least expensive strobe on the market. Because I built up such an assortment of their octoboxes and umbrellas and that sort of thing, when I was ready to advance, because I was still pretty early on in my photography career, I ended up going with the Einsteins. They're actually really great lights. I'm very happy with them. There are great things that you can get when you when you invest in, in better lighting. You can get more consistent color temperatures. You can get a faster recycle time. There are things that you can pay for when you elevate your lighting system. I'll be honest, I, I can create amazing pictures with this lighting system and I'm, I'm still very happy with it. So I'm gonna talk you through everything that I use and I want to show you that you don't have to have a top of the line system to create absolutely stunning pictures for your clients. So this is just the strobe head. This creates light, but this without anything on it creates light that spills in 360 degrees. We have to modify this light to make it shape beautifully around our clients. 
So this is called a reflector dish. It's very simply a shallow metal dish that pushes the light forward. We use this to usually bounce light. It's not typically aimed directly at our clients, but that's not always true. Sometimes you want to create just a hard light set. I don't do this often with portrait clients, but occasionally if I have a young client or if I have a model and I wanna do something really artistic and edgy, usually in black and white, I'll do something like that. So I want to show you a couple of pictures that I've created with reflector dishes just to show you what you can create with such a simple modifier. So this image with the model with her hands up over her eyes was created using simply a reflector dish. That is it. She's backed up against the backdrop so that that one light will spill behind her and brighten the entire scene. The light is probably three to four feet away from her, turned up really high. I have a high f-stop on this because I wanted everything to be sharp. Her hands, her eyes, her eyelashes, her ears, everything. And that's just a one light setup. And then I want to show you a few variations on a reflector dish. So this is a frame set. So this is a reflector dish, but this gives me the ability to add a little bit to it. I can add barn doors to, to the reflector dish to shape where the light is going. I can add gels, which we're going to talk about later on in, in our photo shoots. Gels are ways of coloring the temperature of the light. So if I want to, to make the lighting seem like it was in the evening and add a little of a blue tint, or if I want to make it warmer and just enhance the color of her skin and add a little bit of a, an orange gel, gels just enhance your scene and, and this is just an easy way to add them to, to the reflector dish. But there's another way that we can add them and this is a long throw reflector. This baby just makes the light shine. It can throw light I think 30 yards. It makes it high output. If you shoot outside, if you're shooting sports, if you're trying to light up an athlete on the other side of a football field, or if you're shooting in studio with a model and you're just trying to create something really, really intense and impactful, you might use one of these. So I wanna show you another image that I created using one of these, but with the power on a little bit lower. This is a shot I created using a plant, an artificial plant as a gobo, also known as a go-between, which is just something that you put between the model and the light to create a little bit of a shadow. And that's all that this was. It was one light on the background to illuminate and one light on the model. And that was it, just, just a reflector. So don't be afraid of hard light. We're gonna talk through hard light. I'm gonna show you beautiful ways to work with it, but that is what a reflector dish does. It just sends the light forward. Some other modifiers that I enjoy using are snoots. So this snoot fits right into this frame. Um, a snoot is another way of just directing the light. Frequently with a portrait client, I'm not going to pull this out. As you can see, it's really concentrated light. But if you have a product shot, let's say you're shooting a ring, or let's say you are shooting a portrait client, but you really want to emphasize something that she's wearing or add a pop of highlight on her eye, it might not be the only light that you're using, but it's a great way to add emphasis. These, again, are just tools in a kit. It's just ways for me to shape the light. Another really fun piece to have in your toolkit is an optical snoot. So the idea of gobos is that you're creating this shape, this dimension in your pictures. Shooting in studio, that's something that I don't get to create a lot of because it's a, it's a subject or a model or a client in front of a background. But I love to add shadow. I love to make it seem like there's more going on than just that person in front of a background. So this is by Strobe Pro and it's really great because I'm able to create all these different shapes. You attach a lens on one side and it attaches to your strobe on the other and for instance this is shaped like a window and you're able to zoom it in or out because it's attached to your lens so it can be a sharp line it can be a softer line and you can use it to to be exactly that it can look just like a window or you can make it softer i like it to be subtle i don't want it to look cheesy i don't want it to look like some early 90s you know glamour shot it's supposed to look like your you know window lit no i want it to be soft but it's just a beautiful way to enhance your photography so now I wanna take you through some of my favorite modifiers, a lot of my go-tos, things that I use all the time when I'm in the studio. The first is a beauty dish, and this is something that I use in my fashion and commercial work, but it's also something that I use all the time with my portrait clients. So this is a 22 inch white beauty dish. Beauty dishes are shallow bowl-shaped dishes that again, push the light forward, but I love them because they're able to give both soft light, but light with dimension. You get this hint of contrast, but it's also really flattering. 
Beauty dishes can come in white or silver. The silver ones tend to have more contrast. For that reason, I typically like to shoot with the white. It's just more flattering to the skin tone. Um, but, you, but depending on the style of your photography, you might prefer either. You can get different sizes. Remember, the larger your light source, the softer the light. So for me, I enjoy the 22 inch as it gives me a little bit more play with my portrait clients. I need softer light for them than I would typically use with a model, but it's something that gives me some flexibility for either, either style of work. You are able to put a sock on it to diffuse the light. You're able to put a grid on it to focus the light. It's a really versatile um, piece, of, piece of equipment for my lighting kit. I want to show you a little bit of work that I've created with it. Uh, this was a portrait that I did recently of this beautiful woman named Monique. Um, I just fell in love with her freckles and her curls. And when she told me that she loved red lipstick, we just, we had a moment. We had a moment where we just connected and, and this shot just came to be. And I just used one light for this. And we actually shot this when we were demonstrating how to use grids and all that this was was a grid and a sock on a beauty dish it was a one light setup and it was so simple and it was so beautiful and then this was a shot that was actually a three light setup but the main light on the model's face was a beauty dish it was a gelled beauty dish um, and again, it's light that's soft. There's contrast there, but it's really soft and it's romantic and it's sweet. And depending on how you use the light, you can create such, such versatility with a beauty dish. So now I want to keep going and show you some of my other favorite modifiers. So if you'll come this way with me, we're gonna do another little studio tour. So now I wanna talk you through some of the modifiers that I use when I'm shooting my clients and give you a sense for how you can shape the light when you're shooting your clients. So if you're new to photography, you can often get a sense of how a modifier will behave just by looking at the shape of it. So a strip box is usually a pretty narrow modifier. You can get them in different sizes. I have small ones. This is a pretty large one. This is a go-to for me when I'm shooting maternity. I use it to outline the body, to, to really create form. When you hear the word rim light, frequently people use strip boxes to create that. You are just rimming the body with light, but you don't just have to use it for that. I will often usually raise it above my clients and use it as a hair light. You can use it behind them just to add a little depth to the photo. I pull it out often. I wanna show you a few examples of ways that I have used it. This is a photo that I shot a little while ago and I wanted to highlight the model. She has dark skin, I was using dark tones. I wanted to create something really beautiful but not have her melt into the background. So I used a rim light here in the, in the form of a strip box to give some separation to the image. And then here's a completely different example where I used a strip box and raised it really high above my subject's heads and, and gave separation between the subjects and the background using the same strip box. This is one of my favorite modifiers, one of my favorites. It's a go-to. This is a 36 inch deep parabolic um, Octobox. I use it all the time. You can use it with the grid, without the grid. I almost always have the grid on it. The reason I love this light so much is because it gives you these deep shadows and this beautiful contrast. You can just look at the shape of it and see how that it's gonna focus the light. Again, just look at the modifier and you can get a sense of what it's going to do. With, it, with a modifier that is broad, the light is going to spill. Think of it like a cup of water. The direction that the light is gonna go is the shape of the modifier. I like this so much because it gives me control. When you're shooting in the studio, it's all about control. You are controlling where the light goes. And so I wanna show you a few examples of pictures that I've created with this light. In both of these images, although one is dark and one is light, you can see that the shadows are very purposeful. I'm separating my, my subjects from the background, and in both situations, I'm carving out cheekbones, I'm carving out eyelashes, I'm creating a really dramatic portrait, but it's really simple light. It's a light that is directly in front of both subjects. One light, so simple. And this is a soft lighter. This is the medium Fotex soft lighter. I believe it's 47 inches another go-to for me. And this is a completely different go-to. This is a go-to for me when I want soft light. So this is a go-to for me when I want harder light. So just different purposes. Again, knowing what your modifiers do, knowing what your lenses do, knowing what their purpose is, gives you different tools in your toolbox to create all these different beautiful types of art. So with the soft lighter, I'm typically trying to create really creamy, buttery shadows. So I wanna show you two different types of pictures that I created with this modifier. The first is one that is really dramatic, it's really artistic. With this, I used a single soft lighter. I placed it almost at 90 degrees to the model and I purposefully tried to create deep shadows. But with the second shot, 
I, I lifted it above her and I tried to almost eliminate the shadows but still keep it really soft. One light, one modifier, two very different results but those same really soft shadows. And I'm gonna move my fan back out of the way although we're gonna talk about that in a second. And then back here is my extra large white umbrella. I love this thing. It's huge, but it has so many purposes. If you don't have white V-flats in your studio, you could absolutely, you can use this for that. You can use it for fill. You can use it as a main light. You can use it as an overhead light. There are so many purposes. There are pros and cons to such large modifiers. You can't control the light as specifically. So in order to, to compensate for that, you might have to use V-flats to redirect or cut some of that light, or maybe you're using it as a fill. Often for me, I'm using it as a backlight, an overhead light, or a fill light. Very rarely for me is it the main light, but I am constantly using it in my studio. And I wanna show you a few examples of how I have used it. The first was in this maternity shoot where I used it to help fill from the front and help to eliminate some of the shadows so that I could bring this gorgeous black and white image to life. In the second maternity shot where I lifted it behind the canvas and created this golden halo so that it looked like my client was in a field even though we were exactly where you're standing in this studio. So these are my go-to modifiers. My beauty dish, my strip box, my, my deep parabolic, my soft lighter, and my extra large umbrella. These are what I turn to when I create. They are not overly expensive modifiers, and, and, and it's a relatively small collection, but everything I've created in my portfolio is made with what you see. And then lastly, I wanna show you the thing that makes the magic next to the modifiers, the fan. Everyone needs a fan, you need a fan. Fans make magic with your clients. It lifts the hair, it activates an otherwise very still moment. It just brings this little bit of magic into portraits. Um, I had a floor fan for a really long time and I just felt like it needed the air needed to be lifted. I aim fans at the client's neck. I want the hair to just lift softly. I don't want it to look like they're in a wind tunnel. I want a really soft lift. Um, this fan was actually a little bit of an investment as far as fans go, um, but it has absolutely been worth it. So in terms of pieces of equipment that I would actually highly recommend you have in your studio, this is by Nice Photo, uh, something like that I, I highly would recommend that you have. But this is, this is my studio and this is everything that we are going to use to create uh, together um, during this tutorial and it's going to be beautiful. I really do circle my clients. I go around them, I go a little above them, I go a little bit below them. Move where her head is at. Make sure you're changing her line of sight. I will tell women to touch between their breasts very lightly and then lean forward just a little bit. So much of the sensuality that's added to my pictures is where they're touching their bodies because our eyes go to where their hands are in the shot. Eyes should either look closed or it should be obvious that they're looking down in a way but the eye is not totally closed. If it's ambiguous, pass on that photo. Subtleties get lost on camera. Nuances get lost. If you're gonna make a motion, it has to be exaggerated. Another thing that I want you to focus on is mirroring the posing. And I'll say, I'm just gonna have you roll your shoulder. Oh, that's perfect. And then you're gonna lean down just a little bit. Oh, that's great. Now chin up. Watching hands is honestly one of the hardest jobs when you're doing everything else as a photographer because hands are forever moving. 